What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? 1-833-288-EWTN. I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. 1-833-288-3986. Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. Very glad you could join us as we get closer and closer to Holy Week, uh, the Triduum, Easter Sunday. It's all coming up. You've probably got questions about that if you are a non-Catholic. We can answer those questions. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-EWTN. 3986. If you're listening to us in Qatar, please dial 1 and then 205-271-2985. And of course, you can always send us an email. The address for that, ctc at ewtn.com. Charles Beery is our producer. Matt Gabinski is our phone screener. Rich Jesse handles social media for us. If you have a question uh, to uh, put in the uh, comments box there, on Facebook or YouTube, we're streaming it right now. Just put it right there, and then uh, Rich will see that since you hit the send button, and then uh, he'll get it to us here in the studio. Again, our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Very well. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing decent. Thanks. Interesting question regarding yesterday's program. Diane in Waco, Texas says, could you please review the three criteria needed to admonish discussed on yesterday's show. Okay, thanks. So, I mean, you can admonish any time you feel like it, right? <laughs> you don't have to have these three criteria. That's true. But but these are criteria that can help you discern whether or not you really have a moral obligation to act. Okay, right? um, all right. So, uh, you know, my when I was growing up, my, my mother is a real stickler for grammar and proper English, and uh, she used to take notes on the pastor's homily Oh, uh, and oh. it would, but uh, most people were writing down the, you know, living points. She'd be writing down his grammatical errors because she was sure he would, would want to know about that, you know, and then would sometimes admonish him on his. Sure, he would language, want to know, you know about that. Oh, so you can, yeah. You have at it, you know, you can you can have a great time. Uh, but the question is, when do you really need to do this? OK. And uh, what the moral theologians tell us is that there are three criteria that would really obligate you to, to step in and act. And the first one is that. The matter under consideration is a grave matter, right? Obviously, you know, you can't go admonishing, uh, you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry for every peccadillo because you'd never do anything in your life other ad than admonish other people, and then you yourself would fall prey to Christ's admonition to take the log from your own eye before you take the speck from your brother's. Yeah. Right? So first of all, it's got to be grave matter. Uh, second of all, the, the person that you're admonishing, you need to have some sort of good faith expectation that they're going to listen. And why is that important? Why is it, does it matter that you have some reasonable expectation that they'll listen to you? Because for most people, most of the time, and this includes me, I mean, it happens to me all the time, somebody admonishes you, it makes you want to do the opposite, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. You know, oh, yeah. Don't you think you need to not drink that second cup of coffee, Anders? Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I'll show you. Um, that's just the normal human response, right? So it, it, unless you really think they're going to listen, you might end up provoking them to worse behavior if yeah. you not have some clue that they have a, a reasonable expectation mm -hmm. of listening. And that criteria is often related to the third one, which is that you're the person best suited to make the admonition. And, uh, and again, we get a lot of calls on this show from uh, parents and grandparents uh, who are worried about things that their kids are up to. Maybe they're adult, young adult children, and they want to know if they should say something. And, and often I'll say, well, you know, my guess is you've probably said that thing you're thinking about saying 50,000 times and your children have heard it from you over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and maybe maybe they need to hear this, but they're not going to hear it from you. And so if you say it, again, you may just be at risk of, of inflaming whatever behavior they're engaged in. I remember years ago I was reading the book uh, by Gichin Funakoshi, Karate Do, My Way of Life. Oh, my. It's the, it's the memoir of the man who was responsible for taking Okinawan karate from Okinawa to Japan and popularizing it as a sport throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very fascinating story, but one thing he said was in traditional Okinawan culture, when, uh, when young people were learning karate, they didn't learn it from their parents. Even if your father was a 
master, you farmed your kid out to somebody else because they were more likely to take the admonition from somebody else's dad rather than their own dad who, you know, familiarity breeds contempt and all that sure, sort of thing. So sure. those are your three criteria. And uh, and if, if you meet all those, then, yeah, you probably better say something. Many times we don't. Very good. And uh, thanks so much for your uh, question there, Diane. Here's an anonymous emailer who says, a caller asked if a penitent makes a good confession but later remembers a sin that was not confessed, must that person confess the sin, the, the forgotten sin, that is, or was it forgiven? My confessor, who is a well-educated and experienced priest, told me that if the forgotten sin was mortal, it must be confessed. Did I, did I misunderstand something in your previous answer to that caller? Do you remember all that? Sure. So it is the Council of Moral Theologians and Spiritual Directors mm -hmm. that if you become conscious of a sin that you fail to confess, that you should bring it up in your next confession. That is not the same thing as saying that because you have a memory of an unconfessed sin, you suddenly have moved from the state of grace to the state of mortal sin. I don't think anybody's saying that, okay. right? right. Um, the, uh, you know, the issue here is that if you intentionally withhold a sin from confession, well, then, it's, then none of your sins are absolved. If it's accidental, your sins are absolved. And if they're absolved, they're really absolved. They don't get unabsolved. Absolution mm. is something, something that can be lifted after the fact. If you're absolved, you're absolved. But part of the value of going to confession is the act of humility, the examination of conscience. And, uh, and there's a therapeutic aspect in addition to the, the theological reality of forgiveness. There is a therapeutic aspect about bearing your soul and taking, a, you know, taking responsibility, being held accountable. And those kinds of goods of the soul really do require that you make a good faith effort to, to, to you know, clear the board, so to speak. Sure. Appreciate that. And thank you so much uh, for your email. Uh, we try to get to as many emails as we can each and, uh, each and every day that we're on the air. And that is usually, uh, like today, we'll do two or three, maybe four emails uh, during the course of the hour. Uh, but then once a month or so, we'll do a mailbag program, take care of a whole parcel of emails. Why am I telling you this? Because if you would like to send us an email for a future show, here is the address, ctc at EWTN.com, ctc at EWTN.com. In a moment, we'll get to the phones here. We'll uh, talk with Margaret in San Diego. Interesting question about uh, female deacons or deaconesses, as you wish. Uh, we'll talk about that. Hopefully get your phone and call as well, 833-288-EWTN, if you have a question for Dr. David Anders. 833-288-3986. Call to communion on this Wednesday afternoon here on EWTN. This is a Did You Know moment with Sandra McDavid. Did you know where we get palm branches used on Palm Sunday? When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, it was the date palm that was strewn in his path. In the U.S., it is a palmetto plant, which is used because it grows in greater abundance to fill the needs of over 18,000 parishes. It is found in California, Texas, and Florida. Harvesting the palm can take up to one year. Most of the palmetto palms grow wild on ranches or farmlands, and ranchers and farmers cooperate with the harvesters. The palm branches are cut not to damage the tree, and the process of cutting, cleaning, and preparing is labor-intensive. Some palmetto palms have had their branches cut for over 40 years. Church supply companies deliver the branches shortly before Palm Sunday. Once blessed, the palm branches become sacramentals. This is Sandra McDevitt, 3 w Radio. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I don't like looking back. I prefer to look forward and keep moving forward. There's plenty to cover. I do a lot of research and try to dig out the bits and pieces of a life or of yes. an agenda that people don't want to talk about. The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. Thursday night, 8 Eastern on EWTN Radio and Television. It's called a communion on this Wednesday afternoon here on EWTN Radio. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Would love to get that question of yours answered as we are approaching Holy Week. Wow. 
Hard to believe it's already here. Hey, guess what? EWTN, you may not know this, has its own official YouTube channel with tens of thousands of videos covering just about every conceivable topic of interest to Catholics. And best of all, it's absolutely free. Every day, EWTN adds new TV shows, live events, devotionals, homilies, and specials to its very own branded YouTube channel. When you go to YouTube, just put EWTN in the search box, and you'll get the whole uh, kit and caboodle, as we say. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN, beginning today with Margaret in San Diego, listening on YouTube today. A blessed Lent to you, Margaret. What's on your mind today? Oh, um, hi, Dr. Anders. Um, I heard at the uh, upcoming Senate they're going to be talking about the possibility of uh, female deacons. I was just wondering if you thought that was an actual possibility or it's just, just talk. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So the word deacon in sacred scripture has more than one meaning. And the very same word is used in more than one sense. So, for example, Jesus says, whoever uh, uh, is uh, uh, greatest among you shall be your servant. And the word there is uh, diakonos, which is the word that's translated deacon. Um, in uh, Romans chapter 13, St. Paul says, um, f- uh, he, he commends obedience to civil authorities and says, for the one in authority is God's servant, diakonos, same word. Uh-huh. Right? In, uh, 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 also in the book of Romans 16, Paul commends a, a woman named Phoebe who was a servant to the church. Diakonos. And so we've got the word there used with reference to a moral admonition. Whoever wants to be the greatest is going to be the least, and who wants to be the servant of all will be the, you know, the head of the, the line, and civil servants is you know, being God's servants. And mm-hmm. here this woman who's described as a, 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 a diakonos, a servant of the church. And th- there's no evidence that when St. Paul used the word diakonos, deacon, to refer to Phoebe, that he had in mind an ecclesiastical office that was conferred by laying on of hands in a process of ordination, right? So that as as the first grade of holy order is tending to priesthood and the episcopacy, there's no suggestion that Paul had that in mind when he used the word. So sometimes modern feminists who want to find biblical warrant for the idea of an ecclesiastical office of deaconess that is within the, the uh, the sacrament of holy orders will point to passages like Romans 16 and say, aha, you see, Paul called Phoebe a deacon, but it's a different context, different sense of the word. It's only in the pastoral epistles of Titus and Timothy that you begin to find the technical use of this word to refer to an ecclesiastical office, and there it refers to, to the ordination of men. And again, there's also some historical warrant for recognizing that there was an office set aside for women in antiquity, um, but it wasn't uh, within the, uh, the Sacrament of Holy Orders. It would be women who were appointed to specific jobs in the Church that would be unseemly for men to perform. Like, say, for example, um, if a woman made an accusation of physical abuse against her husband to the bishop, and there needed to be an investigation to see if there were signs or marks on her body of physical abuse, that would be something that a woman should do. A man shouldn't do sure, that for sure. reasons of propriety. And sometimes that kind of task would be entrusted to women who would be called servants of the church, deacons in that sense. Uh, but again, not the, not the first grade of holy orders. Um, so I think that it is entirely possible that, uh, that the Holy See could, and look, what do I know? I'm, you're asking me to predict the future here. Well, I'm, just, I'm just shooting from the hip. Could uh, designate some office or work within the church and they might or might not dignify it with the title of deaconess, but it would be analogous to the way that Phoebe was a deacon or that these women in antiquity were mm. deacons, and it couldn't be conceived of as the first grade of holy orders because that has is, is been is clearly taught by the Church as reserved for men alone. At least that's the way I see it, the uh, the way it all sort of lays out in front of me at this point in time. Okay. Uh, Margaret, is that helpful for you? Uh, yes, thank you very much. 
Thank you for your call. That opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288-3986. Looks like three lines open at the moment. Call to communion on this Wednesday afternoon here on EWTN Radio. Here is Lisa now in Cleveland listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Blessed Lent to you, Lisa. What's on your mind today? Thank you very much, Tom. You as well. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Anders. Howdy. I was just wondering why in the Nicene Creed it says that Jesus was conceived by the Father before all ages, and in the Apostles' Creed it says that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Why the difference? Um, Yeah, thank you. So the Nicene Creed says that he was begotten, begotten um, of the Father before all ages, conceived by the Holy Spirit. We're referring to two different realities here. The eternal begetting of the second person of this trinity is something that does not take place in time. We're talking about the eternal procession of the Son from the Father. You see, God is a trinity, meaning that he's always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh There is no time before which the second person did not exist. The second person is eternal as the Father is eternal. But the nature of their relationship is as... Uh, principle and uh, 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 first principle of the Trinity, which is the Father, and then the procession, that which proceeds from that first principle, namely the Son, and then the Holy Spirit, of course, proceeds from both the Father and the Son. So that's an eternal procession, and the technical term we use to describe that is begetting. That's why he's eternally begotten, not temporally begotten. Okay. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, we're talking about the incarnation. We're talking about the assumption of a human nature to the second person, when the second person of the Trinity becomes a man and is born of the Virgin Mary. And that is a temporal conception. Uh, And conceived is the right word, not begetting. Great question, Lisa. Thanks for your call from Cleveland. Call to communion here on EWTN. Let's go to uh, Jamie now in Tennessee, listening also on Sirius XM Channel 130. A blessed Lent to you, Jamie. What's on your mind today? Hi, Tom. Hi, Dr. Anders. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. I have a two-part question, and I was the first part is I would like for you to, Dr. Anders, if you would please, to comment about this notion that everything that we are to believe as Christians must be in the Holy Bible. Um, I can't remember what you call that. I, I listen frequently, but I think that's kind of an error. And the other thing the other part of it is um, when the Bible was finally closed, the canon was closed, and the council had picked which books were going to be in it, how was the Bible intended to be used? Was it just to be read during services? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate both of these questions. So the first question is about a Protestant doctrine, a doctrine that the Catholic Church has always rejected, and that is the doctrine of sola scriptura, which is Latin for scripture alone or by scripture alone. And the idea in the Protestant tradition is that the scriptures of the Old and New Testament are uh, not only the final authority for Christian faith and practice, but a comprehensive and sufficient authority for Christian faith and practice, meaning that uh, one should not put forth, this is the Protestant position, one yeah. should not put forth any doctrine or idea as an article of faith, that is to say, something that all Christians should believe, um, unless it could be established by the express words or testimony of sacred scripture. That's the Protestant position. The Catholic Church has always rejected that idea, right, for all kinds of reasons. Um, The first one is it's unbiblical, so it fails its own test. If Mm. the idea is you can't put forth any article of faith unless it's established by the express words of scripture, well, scripture does not put forth as an article of faith that scripture is the final authority in that sense. So it fails its own test. It's an internally inconsistent criterion. It's illogical. It cannot possibly function. All right. The second reason is that Scripture itself gives a different criterion for establishing the truth or content or authority of the Christian faith. Jesus made provision for handing on the Christian faith, and it was not to hand out copies of, uh, of uh, the Bible to everyone. What Jesus did was he appointed authorized individuals, the eleven, and said, go into all nations and make disciples and teach everything I have commanded you, which was all his oral tradition, and I will be with you to the end of the age. That's a promise of his divine assistance. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, and the gates of hell will not prevail against this church that I have founded. So 
when Christ made provision for handing on the faith, instead of giving us the Bible, he gave us the teaching church handing on the tradition that he had that he had announced. So that's the Bible gives a different criteria rather than this idea of sola scriptura. Um, third, I find, in addition to being internally inconsistent and irrational and unbiblical, uh, I find the doctrine to be utterly unworkable practically. Um, and uh, I'll give you a couple reasons why that is the case. One of them is that uh, everyone recognizes, uh, Protestants too, that two different interpreters can approach the Bible and they can come to different interpretations about its meaning. Uh, but the problem is worse than just disagreements about interpretation. The problem is that when two interpreters disagree, the Protestant, by appealing to the Bible alone, has no criterion to determine whether or not those differences of opinion matter, right? Because clearly, you know, we're not all going to agree on all the things yeah, all the time. Yeah. You know, St. Augustine once said on the essentials, unity, and other, all other things, charity. But that raises the question, how do you know what the essentials are? Mm. How do you know, if you disagree, whether or not your disagreement is substantive? Sure. Whether or not it's really something that's worth coming to blows over. I'll give you an example. There are Protestant denominations that believe that St. Paul's admonition that women should not pray with their head uncovered, that that admonition is a do-or-die admonition, and that if you don't follow that instruction, then you're not obeying Scripture and you're outside redemption. There are Protestants that hold that. There are other Protestants that say, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's just a minor issue. We can totally disagree about a thing like that. Okay, how do you know that it's a minor issue? How do you know that it's not a substantive issue? The Bible itself doesn't tell you, doesn't give you the criterion to even determine such a thing. Now, you can arbitrarily assert a criterion, and that's what usually happens, but there's no objective way to make that determination. Whereas for a Catholic, we do have such an objective criterion to distinguish dogma from opinion. Again, namely the authority of the teaching church. The church can come by and say, here is a dogma. You must all believe this. This other thing over here, it's not a dogma. You can disagree. Right? We have a way to do this. Sure. They don't have a way to do it within Protestantism. Okay. And so it, it's, a, it's an irrational, unbiblical, and, 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 and dysfunctional criterion uh, as a rule of faith. Now, the question, when the canon was finally uh, articulated by the fathers of the church, how was it intended to be used? Was it just to be used in public worship? No, no. Public worship is the primary use of sacred scripture, and that was the main criteria for determining canonicity. What were the biblical texts that were, in fact, read and proclaimed in the churches? Hmm. That's how the question of canonicity was decided. But beyond the public uh, preaching of sacred scripture, it has always been a, a matter, a subject for, for private meditation and prayer, um, and, uh, and incorporating into one's interior life. And, and uh, interpreters from the very beginning of the church, and especially from the third century, worked out sometimes highly complex theories of biblical interpretation with multiple levels of meaning that were productive of profound theological systems and philosophical speculation. So scripture can be used in a number of ways profitably in the life of the church and the life of the Christian. Jamie, thanks so much for your call from Tennessee. Appreciate hearing from you today. It's called a communion on EWTN. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Dan is a first-time caller in a beautiful city, Rome, Georgia. Listening to us online, EWTN.com. Dan, a blessed Lent to you. What's on your mind today, sir? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, you, you caught me sipping coffee. Uh-oh. <laughs> Okay. It's good to hear you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I've been listening to Dr. Anders and, and you for quite a while now, and, and I've, I'm a Protestant. I've had trouble understanding the the doctrine of the presence in, in the Eucharist. And, you know, I thought for a while, that, pardon me, I thought I thought Catholics were cannibals, but I've learned otherwise. And uh, thanks, thanks to you guys. And so I began to understand what Dr. Anders was saying about it, about Christ being present in substance, and I was like, God, help me to understand this. Give me a visual. And um, then, suddenly, uh, my mind remembered the story in 2 Kings six seventeen, where Elisha's servant, if you looked at the hills, you wouldn't see anything, but once he was granted grace, he could see that there were horses in the hills. And even though the hills if you took the soil and the air DNA, 
uh, it would still be just air and land, but yet the horses were truly present. And I, it was when I saw that as a Protestant, I was like, "Holy smokes! That's that's that might be uh, an example of what Dr. Anders has been trying to explain to me." So I felt like it kind of bridged uh, my understanding with what you're saying, and I just needed to clarify: Am I on the right? track or sure or is yeah that... I, I i love the illustration and i i can't uh, guarantee but this is just the kind of thing that the fathers of the church would have remarked on in their commentaries on the old testament they were always finding these sorts of parallels in the in the narratives of the old testament to help elucidate christian doctrine so to be sure the idea that there are that there are metaphysical realities that are that are embedded in our sacramental system that are not visible to the eye um, or to touch or taste. In fact, it's the subject of St. Thomas's famous hymn, um, Adorote Devote, which I strongly recommend you go look up and read the lyrics to, Devoutly I Adore Thee. It's all about the fact that these realities are hidden from sense, but not from hearing, not from hearing, because it's by the authority of Christ's voice speaking these truths that we believe them. Dan, thank you so much for your call. Glad you're checking in from Rome that Rome, the one in Georgia. In a moment, we'll talk with Scott in Virginia and lots more on this edition of Call to Communion here on EWTN. Stay with us. Prayer changes everything. We read in sacred scripture that when we come to God in prayer, he changes our lot. It isn't so much that the circumstances change. It is that we change and therefore we see the circumstances differently. Prayer does everything for us. It is indeed the air that fills our soul just as the oxygen fills our lungs. We can't do without prayer. To do without prayer means we languish and we die. God wants us to have life and to have it to the full. Passionist Father Cedric Pesenia and Father Richard Ho Lung and the Missionaries of the Poor take you on an hour-long Lenten pilgrimage as we journey towards Easter. Sunday night, 5 Eastern on EWTN Radio. This is Father Joseph Mary of the Franciscan Missionaries of the Eternal Word. Let's pray with Mother Angelica. Lord God, I praise you and bless you for making all of us sowers of seed for asking us to broadcast that seed. Give us a grace, Lord, not to look back, but to keep our eyes riveted on the unplowed field ahead with all the rocks and the hard ground and soil and, and send water into the soil, Lord. Send the water of thy spirit so that the seed we broadcast by example, by media in every form, by love and compassion, may bear great fruit. We ask this in the name of Jesus and Mary. Amen. Anna Mitchell here. Tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Morning Show, our Catholic counselor, Kevin Prendergast, will offer some thoughts on what the existentialists can teach us about our Lenten journey. Now back to Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. So what's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Let's talk about that here on EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. Rather busy phones on this Wednesday afternoon, but we do have a couple of lines open for you at 833-288-EWTN. I may not be able to say that in about 10 minutes or so, be maybe all full. So grab that line right now, 833-288-3986. Scott is listening in Portsmouth, Virginia on Sirius XM. Uh, blessed Lent to you, Scott. What's on your mind today, sir? Uh, yes, I wanted to know what the Church teaches on no salvation outside of the Church. I don't know the Latin wording to it. I don't think it matters. But we had a Legion of Mary meeting the other day, and it was pretty contentious. And prior to Vatican II, or I'm guessing it looks like it's pretty rock solid and you had to be a Catholic after Vatican II. Maybe not. I know that's a gross overgeneralization, but if Dr. Anders could help on that, I sure would appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. There has definitely been development in the way the Church understands this doctrine, but I would dispute that there's been substantive change. So you can go to somebody like Pius IX, who is nobody's idea of a flaming liberal by any stretch <laughs> of the imagination, 
or or Bishop John Carroll of the United States, you know, at the time of the Baltimore uh, conference. And, and you'll find the consistent teaching that people who are not card-carrying Catholics can, in fact, be saved uh, if, in no other way, through in their invincible ignorance of the truth of the Catholic faith. And if you go even further back into antiquity, say, someone like Justin Martyr in the second century uh, clearly believed that uh, the philosophers, the Hellenistic philosophers, participated in the same divine logos who had become incarnate in Jesus. And through their attempt to live a virtuous and righteous life and conform their lives to the model of the divine logos, that they could, in fact, be saved. The uh, uh, the 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 perennial teaching of the Catholic faith is that the saints of the Old Testament who lived uh, before the coming of Christ, the Incarnation, and the sacraments of the Catholic Church uh, can, in fact, achieve sanctity, and many did so, and, in fact, some of them are venerated under that title. I mean, there's a church in my diocese, a Maronite church, called St. Elias, uh, venerating uh, uh, Elijah the prophet. So um, while there has been, like I say, like there's been development, the way it's articulated and further clarifications, the idea that you have to be a card-carrying Catholic, uh, you know, explicit, overt card-carrying Catholic, is, uh, is rejected as erroneous. And there was a priest in Boston, in the United States, in the first half of the 20th century before the Council, who taught that. He taught you had to receive water baptism from a Catholic in the Catholic Church in order to be saved. His name was Father Feeney, and the error associated with his name has gone down in infamy as Feeneyism. Yeah. And, uh, and the Holy See, uh, the uh, Holy Office, in fact, uh, repudiated that doctrine. And I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but I think Feeney may actually have been excommunicated for a while. I think so. Right. I believe he was. And so, you know, the, the, the taking the super hard line position on no salvation outside the church, saying that that means you have to be baptized a Catholic and live within the, you know, the visible boundaries of the Catholic faith was actually, you know, something that got a guy excommunicated for holding that. And that's before the Second Vatican Council. So there has been development, uh, but the radical position uh, is a uh, uh, ha- has always been rejected. Scott, thanks so much for your call. Here is Rick in Minnesota listening on the great Real Presence Radio. Rick, a blessed Lent to you, sir. What's on your mind today? Uh, I'm sorry I didn't have time to formulate a, a good question on this, but earlier somebody called about uh, Phoebe being um, referred to by Paul as a deaconess. Um, there's also this question and it comes to the fore in David Bentley Hart, uh, late translation of the scripture, about uh, a certain Junius that Paul referred to as an apostle. Now, I think in his footnote that Bentley Hart does a very good job of saying, no, this was a woman, and she's referred to as an apostle. Well, if we accept uh, Bentley Hart definition, problem with that is a lot of people say, well, the reason we can't, uh, and by the way, I'm not pro-ordaining um, women at all, so I'm, I'm just making a, a logical argument here. But if you go back to a lot of what people say, the reason women can't be um, ordained is because all of the apostles were men. Therefore, Jesus didn't want any women. Well, if you apply that same logic, all of the apostles, even though uh, Andrew and Philip had Greek names, were apparently um, Jews, and all of the apostles, according to something in Paul in Corinthians, were married. They brought a believing sister along with them, you know, the scripture. Um So, I don't know how to formulate the question, but um, what do you do with the uh, terminology Paul used to describe Junius? Okay. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So, the, the, um, uh, the scriptures are very clear that the Twelve have a unique status within the constitution of the Church, that they are the pillars on which the faith rests, and that image is captured quite explicitly in Revelation 21 when we read the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I mean, it's, 
it's uh, it's uh, Jesus says that you, know, you guys are going to rule over the twelve tribes of Israel. He names twelve people. It's obviously a reference and a relationship to the twelve tribes. And there's the reconstitution of the people of God under the new covenant. There's a foundational role mm -hmm. for apostle that is uh, that is restricted to the twelve. Now, interestingly, the special call of Paul. Mm -hmm. Uh, provoked controversy in his own life for that very reason. I mean, Paul contended throughout his life for the title of apostle, and there were those that that said, "No, you're not. You're not one of the twelve, and you didn't walk with Jesus, and you're not. You don't have that foundational status." And Paul's position was that the found, the twelve were there uh, to be foundational in the sense of the restoration of the people of Israel, and Paul's special vocation was to the Gentiles. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, to the whole Gentile world, and so he also had a kind of foundational status, and clearly the history of the tradition treats Paul that way. I mean, of the 27 books in the New Testament, 13 of them are ascribed to Paul, um, and, uh, and he really is foundational for the Church's understanding of the Gentile inclusion. So he has a role and a status within the constitution of the Church that is, is unparalleled by anybody else. Um, and, uh, and so in that sense, that, that sense of apostleship, uh, which also, by the way, required having seen Christ, right? Um, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? That's the criteria. That's it. Paul says, even though I didn't walk with Jesus uh, when, during his uh, years of his earthly ministry— I'm no less an apostle than the Twelve, because I also have been uh, graced with this revelation that was, you know, something amazing. Now, I would say with respect to uh, Junius and what is this, what is her husband's name? I can't remember, the fellow she travels with, yeah. that much as I said in the last call, the, the words are used ambiguously in sacred scripture, and we shouldn't assume that every time we find a word— uh, that it has a univocal meaning every time, right? Sometimes these words can refer to specific offices, and other times they can re they can they can refer to functions. And an apostle is someone who's been sent. I mean, that's that 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 is one sense of sense of the word. Now, it can be in the special sense of sent directly by Christ for this foundational mission, or it could be in a lesser sense. And, that and could I don't be think, yeah, that could be like maybe as a capital A apostle. Sure, exactly. Versus a exactly. small A apostle. And so I don't see this anything in Scripture or the tradition that could that would justify naming Junius as on a level with with uh, with the Twelve or with Saint Paul. Great call, Rick. Thanks so much for it. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Jamie is listening in Baton Rouge on iHeartRadio. A blessed Lent to you, Jamie. What's on your mind today? Yes, I just had a question about receiving communion twice in one day. Um, our priest told us that that's admissible, and um, I've heard elsewhere that it, it's certain guidelines regarding that, um, that um, you um, have to serve at one of the Masses, and then the other one you can be a participant. Is that true? I appreciate the question. There are some restrictions. That's not one of them. So the second time you receive communion should be in the context of a Mass, and you are supposed to have attended the entire Mass, right? So if you went to communion in the morning, and then let's say, you know, you're at someone's sickbed, and they're administered, the priest comes, and he's administering Holy Communion, but not in the context of the Mass, that would not be an occasion for you to receive communion twice in one day. So you can do it, but there is that restriction on it. Appreciate that. Uh, Jamie, thanks so much for your call today. Here's Kathy now in uh, Florida, listening on Divine Mercy Radio. Kathy, what's on your mind today? Hi. Um, I had a question about redemptive um, suffering. My brother-in-law, which is a Protestant, has had some major issues health-wise, and he's confined to a nursing care. And he likes studying theology, but he has no answer for suffering. <laughs> I was wondering if you could recommend some literature that maybe I could give him on redemptive suffering. Yeah, thank you. I um, I don't have a book in hand that I would give out, but I can but I can reduce this doctrine to its core, and I think make it quite intelligible. So uh, Jesus suffered. That's obvious, and he suffered willingly, and he said to God his Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done. And he calls us to do likewise, and he says, if you want to be my disciples, you have to take up your cross and follow me, and that means the way of the cross, the way of suffering. And St. Peter tells us in his epistle that Christ suffered to leave us as an, an example that we might do likewise. 
So suffering is part of the Christian life. The call to take up the cross and follow Jesus, even in the midst of suffering, is part of what it means to be a Christian. Now, here is the part that is a little bit hard for Protestants to swallow, but I think is, uh, it's critical. When you do hard things, when you do virtuous things, arduous things, that's meritorious. That, that merits some kind of recompense. And uh, Protestants t- typically don't like the concept of reward or merit, but it's all over sacred scripture. Jesus, for example, says when you pray in secret, uh, it's when you pray, pray in secret, and your Father who sees you pray will reward you. If you give alms, do so in secret, and your Father who sees you will reward you. If you fast, do so in secret, and your Father who sees you will reward you. So the idea of merit or reward is a very biblical idea. With the idea of willingly submitting to the providence of God, even when it comes with a certain unpleasantness, is also meritorious. Here's the third idea that is even harder for Protestants to swallow, and that is that when we perform meritorious acts, that those merits can benefit us, but they can also benefit others. They can be disposed of for the good of the whole church. That's also a biblical teaching, St. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. I fill up on my own flesh what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the Mm. church. For the sake of his body, the church. And so uh, when suffering comes our way, the proper disposition is to say, Lord, take this from me but not my will, but thine be done. Or with the Blessed Virgin Mary, he just gets straight to the point and says, be it done to me according to thy word. And when Mm -hmm. we do that, just that act alone, just that surrender to divine providence, brings a measure Mm -hmm. of peace. Uh, You know, the ancient Stoic philosophers realized uh, you can rail and kick against reality all you want, and reality does not care, no. right? Uh, John Cougar sang a song about that, right, called the Authority Song. Yeah. I fight authority, and authority always wins. Every well, time. Well, you know, you could make it the reality song, and reality always wins. You can mm-hmm. beat your head against the wall all you like. So the Stoics said, you know what? Quit beating your head against the wall. Epictetus once said, uh, don't want things to be other than the way they are. Want them to be the way they are. And you will get on well. Yes. And that's not bad advice. It's captured in the serenity prayer that's such a part of the 12-step meetings. You know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. So it's just mm-hmm. it's just sound psychology to say when suffering comes my way, I can either kick and scream and beat my fists, or I can say, all right then, be it done to me according to thy word. Then the added Catholic twist is to say that that's meritorious. And look, it's not that big of a stretch to think of it being meritorious. When you see someone who has that attitude, don't you admire them? Sure. You look and think, wow, I wish I could do that. That's, that's really praiseworthy. Now, why would God not see it the same way? And then, you know, the, the final added piece of the puzzle is that when we do something righteous, that that can benefit other people. And again, that's also biblical. Remember what God said to Abraham in Genesis 18? If I can find 10 righteous people, I'll spare all the rest of them. For the sake of the righteous few, I'll show mercy to the many. There you go. Kathy, thanks so much for your call. Our producer, Charles, reminds me of a uh, Bobby Fuller 4 song, I Fought the Law and the Law Won. Do you there remember you go. that? I remember that one. Yeah, good stuff there. <laughs> call to communion here on EWTN this weekend. Be sure to join us for The Miracle Hunter. That's coming up Saturday, 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern. This week, we will be visiting with Father Gabriel O'Donnell to discuss the cause of Venerable Rose Hawthorne. Also, Bishop Larry Silva of the Diocese of Honolulu updates us on the cause for Joseph Dutton. Be sure and check that out. It's a wonderful program, The Miracle Hunter with Michael O'Neill, Saturday, 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern, only on EWTN Radio. Here now is Charlie in Pensacola, listening on the great Guadalupe Radio. A blessed Lent to you, Charlie. What's on your mind today, sir? Yes, sir. Dr. Andrews, appreciate your show. Appreciate you. That's a three-part question. And I noticed in different churches and different lay ministers when they're distributing communion, and they give a blessing. And the blessing always seems kind of awkward. Different people do different things. I'm, I'm curious, when did it begin where lay ministers uh, began, or even priests be, uh, began giving blessings? How should it be done? And, yeah, that's a two-part question. Yeah, well, that's really easy to answer with respect <laughs> to how should extraordinary ministers give blessings during <laughs> communion. They should not. Don't they do that. They should not. Don't yeah. do that. And yeah. you probably heard me say before, there's a priest in our diocese who once 
was blessing people coming up for communion when they weren't receiving, and he looked over and noticed his extraordinary minister was doing the same, and he wagged his finger and said, tsk, tsk, buddy, you're shooting blanks, <laughs> you know, that uh, the, the, the extraordinary minister has no jurisdiction to do that, and therefore his blessings are, are uh, invalid and ineffective. There's really only a very restricted context in which lay people can give blessings, and, uh, and one of them is the, ble- the blessing of a, by a parent of a child. In the official book of blessings, there is actually a right for parents to bless their children. And the, the reason here is that parents do have a kind of priestly jurisdiction, and I use that word in quotes, you know, in a loose way, kind of priestly jurisdiction over the lives of their children in their own homes, right? The, the, the church, the family, after all, is a domestic church. Parents are uh, in persona Christi in a manner of speaking, not in the same way that the ordained priest is, but in a manner. And so blessing is appropriate in that context. But they don't have that jurisdiction over the parish and, and, the, and the administration of the sacraments. And that's why we talk about the ordinary minister of communion, who is the priest or the deacon or the bishop, and the extraordinary minister who is literally there because they just need an, a new pa- an extra pair of hands to handle so many communicants. Blessing is not his job or her job. should not be done. Do you know when that blessing uh, began? When uh, the pseudo blessing? Well, no, no, not not from the extraordinary minister, but from the priest, where they would, where, where the priest would say, if you would like a blessing and you can't receive, uh, cross your arms. Yeah, when so did that start? I'm, I, okay. Well, I, here's my guess, and I don't know for sure, but okay. here's my guess: up until the 20th century, the the common practice in the West was for lay Catholics not to receive communion regularly. And there is always a blessing given at the end of Mass of the entire congregation. Sure. Right? But w- in the 20th century, when frequent communion became the norm, uh, initially, even when frequent communion was allowed, the lay people who remembered the previous practice didn't always receive communion. And, you know, it used to be a 12-hour fast, and so yeah. if you had to get up and go to work in the morning, you had to have your eggs and bacon before Mass, you know, you weren't receiving, or maybe you had a tender conscience and something that you needed to bring to confession. You didn't go to communion, so you would go to Mass, and there'd be lots of people who would not go to communion on a regular basis, even though they could have at that point. Um, but at some point, and I guess is it's after the Council, when it became really kind of the norm for the vast majority of the congregation to receive communion on a regular basis, the few stragglers who sat in their pews, you know, began to feel kind of left out, like they, there was some sort of entitlement that they were missing out of. And I, I, I suspect, although I don't know, that the practice of offering a blessing in the communion line rather than Holy Communion uh, was a kind of concession to that sense that, you know, I got to go up and get my thing, yeah. right? And I, I really think it's kind of unfortunate. And the Holy See has actually suggested that even the priest need not give a blessing in because he is going to bless everybody. Sure. And sure. if you're not going to receive communion, you don't. There's really no need to get in the communion line to begin with. And it's okay to sit in the pew and know he won't all think you're a terrible person if you do that. Right. That's in fact, right. I might think you were a very well-formed Catholic if you sat in the yeah. pew and you realized that you didn't have to go to communion every week if you had some reason not to. Charlie, thanks so much for your call from Pensacola. Let's go to Nebraska now and talk with Sarah watching us on YouTube today. A blessed Lent to you, Sarah. What's on your mind today? Hi. Um, so I'm preparing to be received into the church this Easter, and I just made my first confession. Mm-hmm. And it was really, like, rushed, I guess, and I just didn't really feel anything afterward except just kind of embarrassed. And I've heard lots of people say, like, you know, you're supposed to feel... Uh, great afterward. And I know that my like affect toward it doesn't mean that the sacrament didn't work, but I was just wondering if you had any advice how to approach it. It just doesn't feel like anything happened. Oh yeah. I really appreciate the question. You don't, you don't know how much I appreciate this question. This is one of my favorite questions, not only with respect to your first confession, but especially, especially when you receive confirmation in your first Holy Communion. Many well-meaning Catholics will pump you up and pump you up and, and make you feel like when you go forward to receive the sacraments for the first time, that that lightning is going to go off and thunder is going to clap and, you know, <laughs> lightning bolts will shoot out of your eyeballs and this kind of thing. And, and you, you really, really build up a huge uh, head of steam and expectation. And I think that that is just entirely wrongheaded. I think it's a terrible, terrible piece of advice to give somebody because that's not how the sacraments work. Now, it is true 
many people will have powerful emotional experiences when they go to the sacraments. But that is entirely accidental. But by accidental, I don't mean it, it, at random. I mean no. that it is, it is inessential to the functioning of the sacrament. And, and in fact, a kind of dry, arid, zero-affect approach to the sacraments can be far, far more spiritually beneficial than the lightning bolts coming out of your ears way of thinking about the sacraments. In fact, I have had people call this show who received that instruction, uh, the, the erroneous instruction, who left the church because after receiving communion for the first time, they didn't have any lightning bolts, and yeah. they, were, they, they, had, yeah. they had unfulfilled expectations. Uh, in fact, what the church teaches about the connection of the emotions or the affectivity to the life of the sacraments is that if if you were to claim that the that the work of the Holy Spirit in your soul was a sensible phenomenon, something that you could discern at the level of your emotional life, that teaching is actually heretical. Like that it's necessary. I'm not saying that you have an emotional experience that's wrong. I'm saying if you claim that you have to have an emotional experience in order to have knowledge of the Holy Spirit's work in your life, that's actually the ancient heresy of Messalianism, ah. right? And there's a, there's a heresy associated with it. And, and why is this so critical, right? Because we're spiritual creatures, not in virtue of our emotions. I have a golden retriever who has a very rich emotional life, <laughs> kind of narrow in scope, but, but profound in depth, you know? And, and, uh, but that doesn't make him a spiritual creature. What makes us spiritual creatures is our rationality and our freedom, our freedom that flows from our rationality, our ability to discern the good from the bad and to make moral choices. And it is at that level, it's the level of my rational, my cogitation, and my free moral choices that the life of grace has its effect and moves me to becoming like Jesus. Like, you know, Jesus didn't have a positive emotional affect towards the cross. In fact, quite the contrary. He wasn't emotionally excited about it. He said, Lord, take this cup from me, yeah. not my will but thine be done. And what the Church tells us and the great mystical writers is that sometimes in that complete loss of affect, when we make the decision in our will to plow ahead and do the right thing regardless, that we are actually in a position to grow far more like Jesus than the guy with the lightning bolts coming out of his eyes. Mm. And, uh, and so I think, uh, I think it's a good thing, potentially, that you didn't have some profound emotional experience, and it's a great thing that you asked the question. Now, if you get lightning bolts, hey, have at it. Enjoy your lightning bolts. I'm not trying to knock that. I'm not saying it's wrong to have an emotional response. It is wrong to think that that's of the essence of the sacrament. So how should you think about it? Did you examine your conscience? Are you contrite for your sins? Not meaning are you emotionally overwrought, but rather are you determined not to do them again, right? Are you persuaded in faith which is a, not an affective reality, that your sins have been forgiven and that you can move forward with a good conscience. If those things have taken place as a result of your confession, then you have gotten the spiritual benefit of the confessional and you can move forward with confidence. Sarah, thanks so much for your call. Bill is a first-time caller in Detroit. Bill, we've got about one minute left. What's on your mind today, sir? Okay, quickly. Um, my wife and I are in prison ministry, and when someone comes up to me in line, for communion, and they had their arms crossed uh, over their chest. I don't say, give them a blessing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but what I do say is, may the peace of Christ descend upon you today and remain with you forever. Amen. Now, is that a blessing, and should I not do that? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it, it, there's a risk that it'll be confused in the mind of the communicant with a blessing, Right. Yeah. Um, that's a judgment call that honestly is for the minister, the ordinary minister of communion. Sure. Right. So check with them. Uh, Bill, thanks so much for your call from Detroit. Couldn't get to David today. Couldn't get to Deborah in Atlanta. Please call us back. Uh, we'll get you on tomorrow at the beginning of the show. If you call at the beginning, <laughs> we'll put you at the beginning of the line. There were also a couple of questions uh, that came in on uh, YouTube from Luca and uh, looks like a Remington also. And what's the third one here? Chike. Uh, some great questions. We'll uh, put those in uh, tomorrow's program as well. Dr. David Andrews, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Do we, don't forget, we do this program Monday through Friday here on EWTN Radio. 2 p.m. Eastern is our live broadcast. Check out the podcast anytime you wish by going to EWTN.com radio. Click on Podcast Central. You will find it 
I promise. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Thanks for joining us. See you tomorrow right here on EWTN's Call to Communion. God bless.